Is it a sign that I've been hanging out with my kids too much when that chirping birds made me think of screaming toddlers? <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that as I was coming, I was, I was totally rational, but... Hey, well, have you ever had a bad day that was just so bad, so miserable, that you wanted to do over? That you wanted to restart the whole thing over? Uh, I remember one such day in my life was when I was traveling home to England for Christmas, uh, and I was going through Amsterdam Airport. And when I arrived in Amsterdam, there was a blizzard going on. Now, this is something I'm used to. When you come from Europe, there's a lot of snow. The winter time can get a little nasty. Um, everybody in Chicago knows about that, right? Because we're still having snow even though it's April. But uh, I landed in Amsterdam and my first flight out of Amsterdam into England was canceled. So I went and tried to get another one set up with that and they canceled that one. And soon I found myself standing in a line that was over 10 hours long that had thousands of people in it. I actually managed to go back and look on my Facebook this week and I found a video from when I was going through this. I filmed myself because I was so bored and so miserable. I was absolutely devastated because I had to stand in that line for so long, it was so cold, and no matter what came up, I actually got to the end of that line and they canceled the next flight, so I stood in that line for no reason at all, and I just wanted to redo the whole day. I wanted to start it all over. I was this close to missing Christmas that year because of it. It was just a bad day. Now, we are starting over the next few weeks to look at a book called Ruth, and the story of Ruth starts with a family that's not just having a bad day, they're not even having a bad year, they are having a bad decade. This family is in the middle of their lives falling apart. But even though that's the beginning of their story, we're picking up in the middle of God's story, really. Because God is already, over the generations that have preceded Ruth's family, and even in the generations that are gonna come after it, God is working this plan of pointing people towards the hope of his loving kindness. God is already in the story of the, the Bible, the greater narrative of the Bible. He has rescued his people from slavery. He came to the Israelites who were captives of Pharaoh, raised up a man called Moses to rescue them, led them out of captivity, and led them to the promised land, the land that would become Israel. He gave them a country of their own where there was no longer a Pharaoh who would enslave them or keep them under the lash of his whip. And we are picking up in a period in Israel's history very shortly after that, a time called the time of the Judges. And here's how we can summarize the time of the Judges. Judges itself, the book of Judges says this. It says in Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This was a time of turmoil, of chaos, of unpredictability. And in this little window, this time when God's people are trying to figure out what it means now that they're in the promised land and now they've seemingly received what God had promised them, we're introduced to a family. A family that starts with a man called Elimelech and a woman called Ruth. Oh, Naomi, I apologize. And Elimelech and Naomi live in the town of Bethlehem. They live in Israel and they're going through some tough times. And so here in chapter one of Ruth, as this story begins, as we see this family, we're gonna see three kind of motions, three events that take place in this family's life. First, they're going to go to Moab. Second thing is they're going to discover what life in Moab is like. And then thirdly, they're going to return from Moab. We're gonna see all this happen in the space of one chapter. And there's a lot that happens in one chapter, so much so that we could probably cover it for numerous weeks. But I want us to, to remember one thing as we go through this, is that this story that we see today is not just about these characters. This is not just the story of Ruth, the story of Naomi and Elimelech. This is God's story. This is his story of hope towards us. It's his story of pointing us towards the hope of his loving kindness. So let's start, let's dive straight in and look at this journey to Moab. Let's look at going to Moab. Now, as you guys know, I'm originally from England, and the way I ended up here is that when I was around 19 years old, I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. I was trying to figure out who I was, 
and what kind of difference I was gonna make out there, right? It's that stage in your life where you're looking to be something significant, something meaningful, and England just wasn't doing it for me anymore. I was not kind of excited about where I was going. I hadn't done that great in school, to be honest. And I had met a couple of Americans at this point, and the thing that always struck me about Americans is whenever I was around them, they always thought I was cooler than I really was because I had an accent. <laughs> So you know what I thought is I thought, you know what would be really good is a country full of people who think that I'm cool. <laughs> that would really help me reinvent myself and get, get where I need to go in life. So I decided I was going to leave England at the age of 19, I was gonna move to the United States, I was gonna do college over here, probably find someone who's way too attractive to be my wife because she thought I was cool, and everything was gonna work out the way that I wanted it to. Now this family, is in Bethlehem, is in Israel in a time when things are unpredictable, unknown, and they're trying to figure out their future. This family that we're gonna see is they're trying to figure out what is next for them, where is God leading them? And this is what we're told in verse one of the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went into the country of Moab and remained there. See, the story of Ruth begins with a journey out of God's promised land to the land of Moab in the hopes of finding something better. Because at this point, there is a famine in the land Things are not going well. And actually, the name Bethlehem means house of bread. Bethlehem, the city, was known for being this place of plenty. It was really easy to grow crops there. So there was usually always enough. Yet, we find this family in a season in Israel where there isn't enough. There isn't enough food to go around. Things are scary. Things are bleak. And so Elimelech is forced to make a choice. This man is forced to make a choice on behalf of his family. Is he going to stay in the land that God had led his people to, or is he gonna try and take control of things? Is Elimelech gonna trust that he is in the place where God intended for him to be, or is he gonna try and secure his own safety? It's not an easy choice. It's not an easy choice to trust God in the middle of a famine, to trust that things are gonna work out, when there's not enough food to go around. And so Elimelech ultimately decides that what's best for his family is to leave the land of Israel, to leave the promised land and go to this place, Moab. Now I wanna show you a map here and show you what this journey might have looked like for Elimelech because it's a lot more complicated than we might imagine. So you can see here on the left-hand side of the screen is the land of Israel, Judah, where Bethlehem is. Bethlehem is right up there towards the top, just below Jerusalem. And in order to get to Moab, which is on the other side of the Dead Sea, you couldn't just make a straight line, obviously. You were going to have to journey around the Dead Sea to reach Moab. So Elimelech is going to have to take his family out of Bethlehem, north towards Jericho, round through the eastmost side of Israel's tribes, down and out into Moab. Now this journey would have been going through dangerous territory towards dangerous territory. This is the time of the judges. Even in Israel, there's chaos, there's danger. And even more than that is in the land of Moab, there is tremendous racial tension towards Israelites. If you go back to Genesis 19 in the Bible, you hear the story of how the Moabite people came to be, and it's not pretty. And from that point on, the people of Israel and the people of Moab, there was a lot of tension between them. So what I want you to see here is that in order to leave the promised land, Elimelech is actually taking on a whole bunch of risk, a whole bunch of danger. He is willing to take his family in a time where there's limited resources, where they already don't have enough, take this dangerous journey, and go to a land in which he and his family are gonna be considered refugees. They're gonna be considered outsiders. They're not gonna have the legal support and the community support that they would have in Israel. All of those things, Elimelech decides, is better than waiting out the circumstances in Israel because it just seems too bleak. I really hate moving. I can't stand it. I hate the whole 
notion of having to pack everything into boxes, trying to play Tetris with the moving van and make everything fit. It's incredibly stressful. So I can't imagine that this was easy for Elimelech. But it was obviously easier than trusting God. It was obviously easier than believing that God really did have their best intended. Maybe in this time in history, maybe the time of the judges, it said that everybody did what was right in their own eyes because they didn't believe that God was gonna do what was right for them. Maybe people felt like they had to take into their own hands their destiny because God just didn't seem like he was gonna do it for them. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Where things arise and you're led to question whether God's really forgotten you? Whether God still really cares? When life gets hard and the circumstances that you find yourself in are dark and hopeless and painful, do you ever find yourself wondering whether God is still really there? It's always easy to hold on to God's promises and to trust what God has asked of you when things are going really well. It's easy to be generous, it's easy to be loving, it's easy to give ourselves in the way that God asks us to when we are in the middle of a season of life that's going well. But when finances are tight, when circumstances in life are painful, when the things that we need to feel safe are taken away from us, is it as easy to trust God? I know for me it's not. I know for me, I see myself in a limelech. Every time life gets hard, I find it hard to trust God with the steering wheel of my life. I know when things are going downward, I feel like I've got to take control. That's absolutely why I moved to America, is because I saw the course of my life in England and I didn't believe that God had good for me there. I believed that if, if I was gonna make something of myself, I had to reinvent myself. I had to go somewhere else. But Ruth is a story about how God is going to show up. Ruth is a story about how God is going to show up in the midst of those circumstances and point this family towards the hope of his loving kindness. But before we see that clearly, this story is gonna take a turn for the worse. When I moved to the United States, uh, it wasn't necessarily what I was expecting. I, I got here and there was a lot of things that I realized very quickly I missed about England. For example, there was no Yorkshire puddings in America. Now if you've never had a Yorkshire pudding, I won't be able to convey, even if we had three hours this morning, just how fantastic this little piece of food is. Yorkshire pudding is like this pancake batter that you have with roast beef and you put gravy on it. Oh, it's so good. And I couldn't find them anywhere here. And then I quickly found that there was all these other things that I missed about England. I even missed the really passive aggressive British people who always told you that things were okay because they were too polite to be honest with you. And I was really sad about all the Americans that told you exactly what they thought all the time <laughs> instead of lying about it to you like British people. But even more than that, I was lonely when I got here. I'd expected life to be here to be way easier that I was gonna get here and all these things that I'd been hoping for and that I was wanting to come together in my life were gonna to fall together into place when I went somewhere new, but they didn't. Life in America was just as hard for me, personally, as it was in England. Life in Moab turned out to be just as difficult as life in Bethlehem. And that's what happens for Limelech's family. So the second thing I wanna look at with you guys is life in Moab. This is what we're told in verse three of Ruth one. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she took what was left with her two sons, uh, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Melon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left with her two sons, without her two sons, and without her husband. What a heartbreaking turn of events. A family leaves Bethlehem to try and find safety in the midst of a famine and life falls apart worse than they could have ever imagined. Elimelech dies and shortly after that, after her two sons had taken wives, her two sons die and Naomi is left with nothing. Absolutely nothing. 
And as heartbreaking as it is for us today to imagine what it would be like to lose a husband, to lose both of your children, we fall short of really understanding how painful this was for Naomi because to be a woman in this culture at this time in history and to not have a husband and not to have two sons who can take care of you and no prospects of a future marriage, you have absolutely nothing. There is no hope for you. See, Naomi at this point, because she had grown sons who were married, was probably older. And so the chances of her remarrying are very slim. And certainly because she's an outsider in Moab, the chances get even lower. Now in a normal circumstance, she would be okay because her sons would outlive her and they would be able to take care of their mother. But both of her sons die. So now Naomi has the added pressure of not only have nothing herself, but now she has two daughters-in-law who also have nothing. And I'm sure in this moment, Naomi looked to the heavens and asked to God, where are you in this? Where are you in this? Now we could try and think about why this might have happened. And we might presume that perhaps this happened because Naomi and her family left the promised land. They didn't stay in the place that God had given them and so now God's punishing them for having done that. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the text of Ruth says and whenever there's a silence, we shouldn't presume on what should be there. We shouldn't presume that this is because God's punishing them. Because the truth is, some of the most painful things in life aren't punishments, they just are. Some of the worst things that we go through the most difficult things that we go through are not punishments, they are simply the result of living in a world that's broken, where things don't go right, where loved ones pass away unexpectedly, long before their time, where finances break down and health breaks down and we're left broken. This past week, Janine and I had to uh, fix a crack in the windshield of our car. And uh, I have no idea where it came from. The car itself was actually brand new. We just bought it recently because we're trying to get a bigger vehicle for when our third baby arrives. And sometime in between driving that off the lot and then the week afterwards, this little crack appeared in the windshield. And in less than a week, it spread all the way across. And so we called up a company to come in to try and fix the crack. And what they said is, we're gonna actually have to replace the whole windshield because the crack's too bad. So we ended up having to to throw out money in a season where we're trying to save and be careful for the baby arriving. That was really difficult. And I could have very easily looked into those circumstances and said, God, are you doing something because I didn't do something right? But things break, things go wrong, no matter where we are, no matter who we are. This winter, a pipe burst at Kesslingan flooded the first floor, disrupted worship for weeks, and cost a lot of money. Are we to assume that maybe God really didn't like the set list for worship that week, and so he thought he'd just flood the church? (laughs) Or do we say that things break and fall apart? Sometimes things just go wrong. You see, no matter whether you are in Bethlehem or in Moab, there is no guarantee that things are gonna go right that things aren't gonna pop up and cause us pain and distress. Naomi and Elimelech thought that they could find hope by going somewhere that seemed safer. But although Moab seemed safer than Bethlehem, they couldn't escape the sting of a broken world. None of us, no matter where we are, who we are, or what we have, we cannot escape the sting of a broken world. But I told you that this story is a reminder of God's loving kindness, that it was a story about how God is going to point us towards the hope of his loving kindness. So how could that story be this story? How could this story of brokenness, of tragedy, of loss, become a story about God's loving kindness? Because the story's not done. We've heard about going to Moab, we've heard about life in Moab, but I wanna show you three instances of God's grace in returning from Moab. You see, 
after her husband dies and after her sons die, this is what we are told in verses six and seven of Ruth one. She rose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So after devastation, death, and despair, Naomi hears that the Lord has visited his people, and she rises to go back to Bethlehem. The home that they had left because they felt homeless, uh, hopeless there is now the center of hope. This place where they felt like they lacked, God is leading them back. I think it's because God is not blind to the plight of Naomi. He's not indifferent to the pain that she is going through. It's convenient that whilst in the fields of Moab trying to find enough to provide for herself, Naomi hears that God has already provided for his people. I imagine at the start of this story, Naomi and her husband Elimelech felt very much like the disciples in a particular story that we are told about in the New Testament. In the New Testament, one time, the disciples are on a boat with Jesus in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and a storm arises, and they are being tossed from side to side, water is filling the boat, and they're afraid that they're gonna die. And so the disciples get up and they go to Jesus who is conveniently taking a nap at the back of the boat and they say, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus, don't you care that things are going so wrong that that we look like we're gonna die right now? Where are you in the middle of all this, Jesus? Maybe that's what Naomi asked when she was going through that famine in Bethlehem when she lost her husband, when she lost her two sons. God, don't you care that my life is crumbling? And we may feel in the center of our own storms that God doesn't care, that he's forgotten about us. But the truth is God never forgets and never forsakes. In that story with the disciples, after they asked Jesus that, Jesus wakes, stills the storm, And this is what he says to them in Mark 4, 39 and 40. He says, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? What Jesus is essentially saying to them is, did you think that I was gonna let this be the end of your story? Do you really think that I didn't love you enough to be there for you when things looked bleak? In the same way, the suffering of Naomi and her daughters-in-law is not the end of their story. It's not the end of their story. God is going to show up in their pain and suffering. He's visited his people in Bethlehem to provide for them. He's gonna show up to provide for this family. We don't know how yet. It's not entirely clear, but we can see that he's on the move. And by the way, where else in the story of the Bible do we see God visiting his people in Bethlehem and providing hope for them when they are hopeless? Where else do we see God visiting that land and providing people with what they need most? Hold on to that. But this is not the only hint we get of God's good grace and love in this chapter. You see, Ruth, who is going to become the center of this story, does something completely unthinkable. Ruth was one of Naomi's daughters-in-law who would marry her sons and she's lost her own husband. And Naomi, in order to try and protect and care for her daughters-in-law, says, go home, leave me, go back to your families in Moab because if you come back to Israel with me, it's suicide. Now we might just think that this is Naomi's grief talking But Naomi is really trying to take care of her daughters-in-law because she knows if they come back with her to Israel, it really is suicide. See, if they go back with her, they won't have a husband to take care of them. Naomi won't have a husband to help take care of them. They will be just as hopeless in Israel as they are in Moab. But there's one thing that makes Israel worse for them. I mentioned before that there was tremendous racial prejudice towards Moabites. Moab Moab and Israel didn't get along very well. 
And in fact, we're told later in the book of Ruth that a good day for Ruth in the land of Israel is a day in which she's not assaulted openly in public. That's what awaits Ruth as she goes to Israel. And so Naomi tries to get her to stay. And so we are told in verses 14 through 17 what happens when Naomi asked this of her daughters-in-law. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you, or to return from following you, for where you go I will go, and where you lodge I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. Ruth is willing to sacrifice her own security and well-being to love her mother-in-law. I cannot convey to you how absolutely unthinkable what Ruth is suggesting here is to cling to her mother-in-law and to tie her future to this woman who has no hope, to go to a foreign land where she will almost certainly be mistreated, all out of love for Naomi. What an amazing display of love. What an amazing friendship and display of care. She is declaring in the strongest possible terms, I will not leave you. My future is gonna be your future. When we see this, and we see someone doing something so unthinkable, we should pause. As we're going through chapter one and we see this, we should pause because when someone does something this unthinkable, usually the hand of God is behind it. When someone is willing to do something so shocking, usually God is on the move. When you are going through heartbreak and loss and pain, take notice of the people around you. Take notice of the ones who are loving you and are devoted to you, because through them you'll see a window into God's love for you. And in fact, more than that, did you know that your friendship for the people in your lives when they're going through pain can be a window into God's love for them? That is an amazing power that you have in your life, to be able to display the love and the kindness of God to people in their most broken hours. Without spoiling too much of what is to come in the next few weeks and in the next few chapters, God is going to use the faith and the courage of this woman to point Naomi back to the hope of his loving kindness. Her story's not done. And by the way, where else do we see someone in the Bible placing their own well-being to the side in order to love others? Where else do we see in scripture someone willing to sacrifice their own safety to love others? Hold on to that. One last glimpse of God's love as we reach the end of this chapter. Naomi comes back to Israel, comes back to Bethlehem, and she says in verse 21, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. When Naomi and Ruth reach Israel and they come back, everyone can see the brokenness in Naomi. They see the devastation and the death and despair that she's been through. And Naomi says, the Lord has brought me back empty. Now at first glance, that seems pretty heartbreaking. And for sure at this point, Naomi is still beaten down. But she says something that I'm not even sure she realizes is a pointer towards what is happening in her life. Because she says, the Lord has brought me back. Right, he may have brought her back empty, but she acknowledges the one who's brought her back is the Lord, and when has he brought her back? When has he brought this woman in need back? At the beginning of the barley harvest. She's not only coming back to Israel when the famine is over, she is coming at the start of a season of plenty. 
This is a huge signpost for us to see that God is on the move and is about to change this woman's story. Is about to change the story of Ruth. And by the way, where else do we see God show up and bring rescue in a moment that seemed like the end of the story, in a moment that seemed bleak and broken? We just celebrated it last week. We just celebrated the story of Jesus who in his worst moment on the cross, God revealed hope. See, the story of Ruth behind it all is a story of God pointing us to the hope of his loving kindness, pointing us towards the truth that he does not forget us. This is what the whole story is about. This is one story in the middle of a bigger story. And the whole time, God is reminding his people, chasing his people, loving his people, and pointing them towards the hope of his loving kindness. When I got to America, it didn't take long before I hit a point where I was completely just alone and anxious. All these things that I dreamed up and I imagined in my mind would happen for me when I got here didn't happen. Life in Moab was not what I wanted it to be. But at that time, I didn't know that my story wasn't done. That I was at the beginning of a moment in which God was going to do things in my life that I could not have imagined. That he was gonna make me into a person that I couldn't have ever imagined I would be that I was gonna meet people that I never thought I was gonna meet. Because God was on the move. And I want you to see in this first chapter of Ruth that God is beginning to move to change a story of brokenness, of tragedy and loss into a story of the hope of his loving kindness. And it is gonna point us towards the one who visited his people in Bethlehem and who called himself the bread of life. It's gonna point us towards a one who is willing to sacrifice his own life for the sake of love for others. And it's gonna point us towards a one who brought us back in a moment that seemed like the end of the story but was just the beginning. This is the story of a God who is always at work. And no matter who you are, where you are or what you've been through, your worst moments are not the end of your story. Not when God's involved. Whenever Jesus is involved, the end of your story is always his goodness. Would you pray with me as we close this morning? Father, I thank you for this amazing story of Ruth and as we begin to get our feet wet and dive into this, God, I pray that you would use this book to remind us of your loving kindness. To remind us that our stories are not our worst days. That you never forget, that you never forsake, that you never abandon, but you are always there. Lord, we wanna be able to trust you whether in Bethlehem or Moab, we wanna be able to follow you in plenty or in famine. Help us, Lord, we pray, to know you better and to know your love. In Jesus' name. Amen.